What is it? It was an egg. Look. <gasps> a baby dinosaur hatches in the midst of a colony of lemurs who are curious about the little beast. And that scene from Dinosaur, one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week, plus a hands-on report from Michaela on the first movie made specifically for distribution on the web. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Michaela Pereira of DDTV's Internet Tonight. Just in that opening glimpse of Dinosaur, you could see what a good-looking movie this is. The making of the film is already a Hollywood special effects legend, how photography of real landscapes was seamlessly combined with computer-generated dinosaurs to create a convincing view of life on Earth as it might have looked millions of years ago. That little creature grows up to become an iguanodon named Aladar, who has never seen other members of his species and likes to fool around with his foster family of lemurs. <laughs> Life on Earth changes when a devastating meteor shower alters the climate. The movie's heroes join a vast migration across the desert lands in search of water. And Aladar finds himself in conflict with Kron, the leader of the trek. They're having a hard time keeping up. So, you know, maybe you could slow it down a bit. <laughs> hmm. Let the weak set the pace. Now, there's an idea. Better let me do the thinking from now on, Aladar. Watching those scenes, I admired the artistry of Dinosaur, but I was disappointed by how human the characters were made to be. Their modern sensibilities and personalities have none of the fearsome Darwinian power that they must have had in real life. I'm more impressed when dinosaurs aren't cuddly. But since the movie decided to go that route, maybe it should have been a little more cheerful because the meteor show and that long desert trek are going to be tough going for little kids. Older kids, okay. I like Dinosaur, but the story doesn't really realize the potential of those amazing visuals. So what you're saying is you wanted a silent film? No, I mean, no, no. No, because the, the power of the voiceovers, uh, Alfred Woodard and Ozzie Davis and, and mm -hmm. all, all of these voice actors, they were, it was really great. They mm -hmm. actually managed to bring life and humanity. Yes, that didn't bother me in the least. I really like this movie, aside from the, the, the beauty of it, the sheer beauty. I mean, they had animators galore working on this and oh, new yeah, 3D it's... effects, and they built a new digital studio. You can't argue with me that it was beautiful. No, no, I'm saying it was beautiful. I'm right. saying, though, that I think there's a funny line that you cross over in realism, and after you get a little bit too realistic, you can no longer have the funny character voices. I didn't feel that way at all. For example, in The Land of Time Forgot, which is about talking dinosaurs, no problem at all. Right. But in Jurassic Park, you wouldn't expect the dinosaurs to but talk it was, because they're humans. real dinosaurs. There were humans versus dinosaurs. Yeah, but there are no humans movie, in this movie. In this movie, they are. They look so good. They look so good that somehow you don't want them to be diminished into, into in the characters least. in this in this in this kind of human story. I was glad that they didn't. Sh they chose for the Carnotaur, the evil toothy beast, not to speak because it made him even more sort of. You Where's know, my point? Well, where do you stand? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Well, I'm thumbs up, but I just have those little qualifications. Okay, fine. Our next movie, although geared to an audience a wee bit older, is far more sophomoric. Road Trip is the latest offering in the collegiate humor category. Meet Josh, played by Brecken Meyer, a student at Ithaca University. His life is pretty standard. Late papers, annoying TAs, and all the situations typical of dorm life. Until the fateful night when Josh kind of cheats on his longtime girlfriend, Tiffany. To make matters worse, the act is caught on videotape which mistakenly gets mailed straight to Tiffany. She gets back to the It leaves in three days to get there. Get where? Austin? It's like 10,000 miles from there. 1,800. Josh is overcome with remorse. His buddy E.L., played by Sean William Scott, is always willing to help out a friend and offers some comforting advice. There are these rules that guys have. An understanding as to what exactly constitutes cheating. Take your situation, for example. <laughs> It's not cheating. It's never cheating when you're in a different area code, not to mention a different state. Staying behind is their oddball friend, Barry, played by Canadian comedian Tom Green. He finds great enjoyment in feeding a pet boa. Better eat him, Mitch, before I do. He's tasty. He's tasty, Mitch. The comedy that ensues when these guys hit the road is pretty juvenile and raunchy. And unlike American Pie in Election, 
two recent films that covered some of the same territory. Road Trip doesn't have clever dialogue and subtle humor. As for Tom Green, well, you either love him or hate him, and many people likely will not see the movie for that very reason. However, in support of my fellow countrymen, he is very funny here, and his narrator steers the film and keeps it on track. But apart from his antics, Road Trip got a few laughs, a whole lot of groans, and ultimately a thumbs down for me. Thumbs down for me, too, with a certain amount of affection. Uh, exactly. I there feel the were same way. some laughs in mm -hmm. the film. They didn't yeah. reach critical mass. Yeah. I would laugh, and then there would be some silence. Mm -hmm. After a while, something else would happen that was funny. The movie definitely does want to be raunchy. It wants to be in the American Pie tradition, right down to the use of the video camera, which is right, right. out of American Pie. Right. And lots of nudity. Mm -hmm. And a lot. A whole lot. A whole of lot nudity. of nudity. And uh, lots of. Uh, real racy dialogue mm -hmm. that is okay if it works right. you have to have a kind of an energy to push it you know up to escape velocity in terms of the humor or otherwise it they just simply the sound like they're there. standing there uh using these words without knowing the music behind them the characters themselves are great D dj qual mm -hmm. who played kyle i thought was hysterical that kid was great and the transformation that he sort of went through throughout the movie was wonderful. And the, the four guys themselves were a likable bunch. But you're right, the energy wasn't there all the way through the movie, which is unfortunate. You got it. Later in the show, Jackie Chan hits the Wild West in Shanghai noon. Coming up next, Woody Allen and Tracy Ullman in Small Time Cook. Frenchie, I got a brilliant idea. I'm going to make us rich. How are you going to make us rich, rather bank? How'd you know that? That's fantastic. How'd you guess that? What? That's fantastic. Well, first shot on the box. You got it. Woody Allen plays an ex-con who wants to be a bank robber in small-time crooks, and Tracy Ullman is the sardonic wife who has heard his big plans a thousand times before. They're sort of like the honeymooners. Allen's character has a group of low-life friends that he enlists in his plan to rent a shop near a bank and drill a tunnel underneath to the bank's safe. But these guys are not skilled construction workers. It's never going to work the drill, I'll tell you now, okay? It's going to make a lot of noise. No, no. Hey, what do you think, what do you think this is? This is why I get the big dough. We wrap this blanket around it, it's know, fine. You got to know how to work a drill like that. <laughs> the shop upstairs is a front for the operation where Tracy Allman sells her cookies. The cookies turn out to be amazingly popular. Elaine May plays Allman's cousin, who's enlisted to help deal with the enormous crowds. I just want to say that, that we're expanding, and there are men in the back right now tunneling. The couple get rich off the cookies, not the bank heist. And Allman attracts the predatory attention of Hugh Grant as an art dealer who thinks he can romance her and get his hands on her money. Nice nose. Yeah, no, the bouquet is very special. No, no, I mean, you've got a nice nose. <laughs> yeah. Small Time Crooks is funny and goofy and a straight comedy without any of the autobiographical or analytical or experimental or quizzical or Freudian touches that Woody Allen has used in a lot of his recent movies. There's no other purpose this time except to make us laugh. And I did laugh, not only because of the funny situations, but also because there's real wit in the carefully written dialogue as Tracy Allman uses her sharp tongue Hugh Grant schmoozes her, and Woody plays, not as usual intellectual, but a defiant and insecure working-class guy who feels left behind by his social climbing wife. He was happier when they were poor. Could it be a new era of Woody Allen? I don't know. I have to admit, I don't really get Woody Allen. Mm. I get a little tired of the neurotic outbursts, and there were plenty in this movie. Mm. His strengths lie in directing, and... Tracy Ullman, one of my favorite comedic actresses, and Elaine May, hands down, far the, probably the most entertaining person in this movie. But the story was my big concern. It lagged. Not only did I really like the small-mindedness of these, of these guys, mm -hmm. but when they went into... I know the story was supposed to be them progressing to rags to riches, yeah. but it just fell on its face, and it lost its, 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 hum, I think its it humble has to, beginning. It has to go somewhere. It, has to, it can't just end... I mean, right. if this had been anybody else making this movie, it would have ended with the joke that the guy was selling the cookies. Here he takes a U-turn. He carries it to the next level. But it he didn't go to the Hugh next Grant, level. He brings in Hugh Grant, and Hugh Grant is very funny. Very funny is this guy who is actually pandering to these rich people right. uh, who don't have any taste, uh, but he doesn't have any taste either because he'll do anything they tell him to do. And also, as for Woody Allen, I, I guess you either like him or you don't. Right. I like and him. I, and I, I have liked not. him. From the beginning of his career, I mm -hmm. like his comic persona. Mm -hmm. I like the insecurity. I like the way he talks. 
and they drive like, me up the wall. And okay, I, and well, I Woody, I'm case, sure you're a wonderful an man. It's case. an A. But the fact is, he does do really smart comedy. The comedy is subtle. The dialogue was subtle. And it, it was very funny. But I give it a, a, a somewhat reluctant thumbs down. Okay, well, mine's like here. Okay. Coming up next, East meets West, when Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson team up in Shanghai Noon. <laughs> Jackie Chan is an Imperial Guard from China, and Owen Wilson is a goofy train robber in that scene from a very funny new Eastern Western named Shanghai Noon. The movie takes place in the 1880s when Chan journeys to Nevada to try to rescue a kidnapped Chinese princess, and his enemy in that scene turns out to be his ally in the cause. Owen Wilson's performance is the treasure in this movie. Listen to his dialogue here. Well, what are you doing? No, no, I sort of like to be the only guy that talks, Wallace, all right? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, that's okay, good. Thanks, that works, that works. Come on. Come on, come on, big enough, let's go. Why is the new guy talking? Where'd you get this guy? Jackie Chan gets into a fight with pro warriors, defeats a bunch of them, is hailed as a hero by a rival tribe, and marries the chief's daughter. No time at all, his new sidekick is trying to sweet talk the bride. I am like a wild horse. You can't tame me. You put the oats in the pen, though. And I'll come in for a nibble every day. Lucy Liu plays the kidnapped princess who is moved by the plight of Chinese indentured workers. Why would she want to stay here? Maybe she can do more for the people here than she could back in China. Jackie Chan is a natural comic She's actor, very good here, but the surprise is no, Owen no. Wilson, who you may remember from Anaconda and The Haunting, and whose comic personality puts a funny spin on everything he says. He's an easygoing, relentlessly casual, fast talker who outsmarts the villain at the same time that he's showing Jackie Chan how to survive in the Wild West and enjoy yourself and have a good time. Shanghai Noon is a keeper. I'm still laughing. It's so fresh <laughs> in my memory. This is such a funny movie, and I liked it more than I thought as well. I like westerns. I like kung fu, a kung fu western, even better. Mm -hmm. Owen Wilson, I describe him as sort of this California Zen um, alternative cowboy type yeah. <laughs> who thinks he has all this stuff to teach Jackie yeah. Chan when in reality it's the other way around. Uh -huh. Jackie Chan, it's this whole buddy movie, fish out of water. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that, as always, you can rely on his technique with props in, in his fighting scenes. Oh, he always fabulous. uses... Fabulous. Fabulous. His, his trademark is to use whatever's at hand. He and has yeah. one entire martial arts sequence involving evergreen trees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no matter what he touches, it turns into a prop, and he's great at that. And you know... I guess it was only about a year ago we were looking at Wild Wild West, which was really an unbelievably bad movie. And yeah. here, once again, you have some of the same elements, but transformed through these two guys into what is really surprising. I know there are people who are going to say, I don't like westerns, you know what? I don't like kung fu movies. If you like comedies, you're likely and to like And people are going to say it's the same Jackie Chan formula that we've seen over and over again. But the fact is, it works. Yeah, it's it funny, it's fun, it's entertaining, and he's good at it. Way to go, Jackie. <laughs> well, coming up next, a new movie made especially for the Internet, Quantum Project, leads my web report when we come back. This is mine, the one and only, was OBGYN at the birth of the Internet. The Internet has been a great place for short films, so much so that the art of the short has been reinvigorated. But will longer films or even features ever find a home online? And can they be profitably produced for Internet distribution? Well, Quantum Project may put this to the test. Starring Stephen Dorff, Faye Masterson, and John Cleese, the film is a 32-minute sci-fi romance. It's the first Hollywood-level multi-million dollar motion picture developed and produced specifically for the Internet. What do you need? Electrons don't talk. What do you need? I think I'm having a psychotic episode. I always wanted to do something for the internet. I have a lot of friends involved in the internet, and um, this was a good group of people, and it is the first. Depending on the picture quality, Quantum Project costs $3.95 or $5.95 and can be downloaded from sitesound.com. There's nothing to return, but downloading up to 166 megabytes can take a while. And the quality? Well, not bad for a computer screen. What if your precious five and a half meters were downloading on the parquet flooring? I mean, what then? 
What would your life mean? Whether features will ever find a home on the web is uncertain, but the rage over short films continues to grow. This past March, Yahoo Internet Life magazine held its first annual online film festival and awards. The turnout was overwhelming, and the deal-making was at a frenzy. Digital filmmaking was a hot topic, too. Oscar winner Holly Hunter appears in the much-talked-about digital release, Time Code. I think we should perform an intervention. And I know that most of the time they're not successful, but I think that this is something we should be fabulous for him. I certainly think that there will be many more movies on the Internet um, as to whether or not they're shot with this particular style. Who knows? But I think that this opens up a lot of possibilities for a lot of different filmmakers. Director Mike Figgis, who debuted Time Code at the festival, believes new technologies will democratize filmmaking. Anybody anywhere in America or the world, the world. theoretically, can, can get hold of a camera, right? And get access to a laptop. That's not such a huge challenge, you know? Right. So suddenly you have the potential for anybody to be a filmmaker. The web is changing the way films are made, distributed, and now even viewed. Keep your eyes peeled and your mouth poised. It's bound to be an interesting ride. As for Quantum Project, although it looked pretty good, I couldn't follow the storyline. And even with a high-speed connection to SightSound.com, it took me hours to download. How was your experience? Uh, my experience was pretty bad. Mm. Uh, I went to Google and searched for Quantum Project. And ah, so I managed, door. I went in the back door. I went <laughs> directly to the film site without going through the warning that would have told me that it's not compatible with Macintosh. So I went straight to a page that allowed oh. me to download. I downloaded three times. It broke off. Finally, I got it all downloaded, only to find out at that point that it's not compatible with Macintosh for encryption reasons. Really? So basically, I went to the theater, and the projectionist wasn't able to show me the film. That's going to be and my review. And the fact is, your experience at the theater is just as important as yes, the it movie is. itself. Yes, they it go is. hand in hand, and one will affect the other. And thus, until they can perfect that, until we have broadband that can assure us smooth, mm -hmm. easy access and an experience, it doesn't matter what the end result is. There are two other issues here. They're charging six bucks for a 32-minute film. That's mm. $24 for a feature-length film, which is pretty pricey for a movie you haven't even seen yet. Right. My feeling is that made-for-net movies, like made-for-video movies, will always be perceived as having something a little bit wrong with them, because if they were a little bit better, they would have gotten a theatrical release. That doesn't apply to short films, which I look at all the time and right. I love on the web. The web is made for short films, but I don't think yet that feature films are ready for well, prime for net time. Well, for me, at this point, it's hard to say what is going to happen, but I know that this is exciting in the fact that it was the first. Oh, yeah. And they have made some, they've broken some ground here, so kudos to them for doing that, at least. Okay, when we come back, my video pick of the week, a supernatural classic from France. Roger Ebert in the Movies Video Pick of the Week is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. My video pick this week is Orpheus, a mythical story of a journey to the land of the dead, which is on a lot of lists of the great films of all time. Directed in 1949 by Jean Cocteau, it's a modern version of the story of Orpheus, who follows his dead wife into the underworld to bring her back to the living. In this version, death is a severe princess who drives in a chauffeured Rolls Royce and her servants are stormtroopers on motorcycles. Descendez, monsieur. Laissez faire mes hommes. Sortez le corps de la voiture et transportez-le là-haut. This beautifully restored DVD version of Orpheus is in a three-film box set from Criterion, which also contains Cocteau's famous 1930 surrealistic film, Blood of a Poet, with this famous image. Cocteau's Orphic Trilogy is newly released on DVD, and it's my video pick of the week. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. Two thumbs up for Dinosaur. We admired the visuals, disagreed about the characters. Two thumbs down for Road Trip, where the laughs didn't reach critical mass. A split decision on Woody Allen's Small Time Crooks. I thought it was funny Michaela had a problem with the Allen persona. And finally, two thumbs up for the surprisingly funny Shanghai Noon. It opens next week. Remember, you can hear our reviews on the web, Michaela and I, at ebert-movies.com. My print reviews at sometimes.com slash ebert. Michaela is at zdtv.com. Next week, a journey to the White House for a special show, a conversation with President Bill Clinton. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.